Hey everybody, welcome to Chatbox. I'm David Cruz. April is Jazz Appreciation Month, and we will celebrate a Jersey jazz institution, WBGO Radio in Newark, celebrating 45 years this week. We'll talk with the station's CEO about the state of jazz and public radio in our second half. But let's start today with the most recent entry into the gubernatorial campaign. It's his third attempt and the one he promised to us four years ago. Republican Jack Chitterelli joins us now. Assemblyman, welcome back to the show. Good to see you, man. Always great to be back, David. Thank you for having me. So you had a nice crowd this week. You were reminiscing about that election night back in 2021 where Republicans picked up seats in the legislature and in towns and in counties up and down the state. Last year, you gave a lot of it back. Uh, has the Republican Party recovered from 2021? Oh, I believe it has. And I think we'll see that in this year's elections, uh, including the presidential race. But I'm looking forward to 2025. Um, really excited about the other night. As you know, David, this is the worst kept secret in all of New Jersey me running for governor, yep. uh, but it does feel great to make it officially official. You said, I think, words to the effect that New Jersey is in bad shape. Is the state in bad shape? Well, David, we've got the worst property taxes in the nation. It's the worst state in the country in which to do business. It's a state nearly impossible to retire in. And yes, we have pockets of success in different parts of New Jersey, but overall, I think our schools are failing our children. We've got kids that are graduating that are not on grade level for reading and math, nor are they ready for careers if they're not going to college. We've got a lot of work to do. I'm happy to do it. All right. We'll get to some policy stuff uh, in a couple of minutes. But just politically, uh, the pundits say that you and your good friend John Bramnick, who's also running, uh, occupy the same middle ground of the Republican Party. Are you concerned that come 2025 in a primary Hardcore voters might end up picking someone who's maybe too far right for the general electorate? Competition makes us better, David. So I welcome anyone and everyone into the race. I'm confident in, in me as a candidate, and I'm confident in our message. We've got a lot of name ID from being up and down the state as we've been over the past couple of years. I'm confident that when all is said and done, we'll win the primary and then we'll deliver a victory come November 2025. You fell short by, um, what was three percentage points uh, in, a, in a campaign that you noted surprised a lot of people. Um, you think that just being able to get out there a little bit more is going to make up that difference? I think that there's a lot less indifference this time around. Last time around, my race came 12 months after Donald Trump had lost the state by 16 points. And that caused a lot of Republicans to not believe. I kept telling them how close it was going to be. Many people said afterwards, gee, Jack, I never thought that that was the truth. I thought you were just giving me the company line. Hmm. I think there's going to be a greater Republican turnout this year. And you're also going to see a lot more soft Democrats and unaffiliated independent voters vote for Jack Cettarelli because they're dissatisfied with what's going on in the state. And they like my message. You have evolved on Trump uh, from unfit for office and a charlatan to endorsing him recently and saying the other day, I think the country was better off during Donald Trump's four years than Joe Biden's four years. What changed your mind about Donald Trump? I think the reason why Donald Trump is ahead in the swing states and the reason why the race is tightened here in New Jersey is because people see what they see. They see what they see, what's going on, on the border each day. They see the lawlessness in the community. They see the price of groceries. They see a president, unfortunately, just looks too old for the job and a VP who's unqualified. So those are the reasons why I believe Donald Trump will win come this November. But what changed your mind specifically? Because, I mean, you, it, it, I'm just curious as to how you go from saying someone is unfit for office to then endorsing them. I think the first decision any candidate makes if the running for president is who their VP is going to be. I was very, very dissatisfied with Joe Biden's pick and Kamala Harris. I think a lot of people were. Um, so I voted for Donald Trump last time around. I, I thought he was the better candidate. The country did well underneath him uh, during his presidency. And I do think when you compare his four years to the past four years, um, the decision gets easy. The choice is binary now, David. He's the Republican nominee. He's also just a couple of years younger than, than the president. I mean, what's the cutoff? Oh, I know. I know there's little, like, maybe only four years difference in, in age, but my goodness, uh, he doesn't near, li, ne, look nearly as fragile as Joe Biden. 
So, uh, I mean, everybody ages differently, but the present just doesn't look up to the job. And I think a lot of people agree with me. Again, that's why you see Donald Trump ahead in the swing states and the race having tightened here in New Jersey. You called Abraham Lincoln a role model the other day. I assume you, you've studied him a bit. What do you think he'd say about Donald Trump? Uh, I'm all about uh, Abraham Lincoln because he was about change. Yeah. And we need change here in New Jersey. We've had 25 years of Democratic rule in the legislature. We'll have eight years of Murphy under our belt come November of 2025. And what I say to the people in New Jersey is if you want change, you've got to make a change. And so give Republicans a chance. You're going to like what you see. So what would Abe Lincoln say about Donald Trump? Oh, I don't know. You'd have to ask him, David. <laughs> I'd have to ask Abe Lincoln. I mean, I'm just wondering, because you call him a role model, you say you know a little bit about him, you've got to have some sense of, of what he would think of a, of a guy like Donald Trump. I mean, it's not like Donald Trump is your ordinary guy. Well, David, I'm hoping you're going to talk about New Jersey. But we'll first, let there. me say that would, yeah, what we need is a Republican candidate who can unite our party not one who's going to call moderate Republicans rhinos or Trump supporters crazies. Um, that, th there's no unity in that. People are entitled to vote for who they want to vote for. But we also need a candidate that can convince Democrats to support our ideas. And we need somebody who can also attract unaffiliated independent voters, not someone who repels them with personal insults or extreme rhetoric. You know, I wonder who you're referring to uh, when you say that, because that's a Donald uh, Trump hallmark. But I assume you mean somebody else, yes? Hey, all I know is I'm going to go out there each and every day, David, and talk about what I'll do for the people of New Jersey as governor. We've got a property tax crisis, a business climate crisis, tough state to retire in, and our schools are failing our children in too many districts. All right, let's talk about some of those things. You said you would overhaul public school curriculum, ensuring age-appropriate lessons and focusing on basic skills. Are there age-inappropriate lessons being taught in our public schools today? David, I said this in the last campaign. I'll say it again. I don't think gender ID and sexual orientation are appropriate kindergarten lesson plans. Um, I think what we need to do is teach the golden rule. And I talked about that the other night, too. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Children of any age can learn that lesson. I also think we need to be very careful about teaching explicit sex acts at too young of an age. These are some of the changes respecting the role of parents in the educational partnership, providing more basic skills training. We have kids graduating high school who are not on grade level for reading and math. Four out of five in the Newark School District alone. And as a father of four who's been through this himself, we need to provide more vocational training opportunities because not all kids want or need to go to college. But you're not saying that there are age inappropriate lessons being taught in our public schools today. What you're saying is that you want to avoid that happening? I believe gender ID and sexual orientation in kindergarten, David, is age inappropriate. Is that being taught? There's, I'm sorry? Is that being taught in our kindergartens? It is. In what school districts? It's across the state, David. That was yeah. a promulgation. Of, yeah, that, that came out during Murphy's first term. We talked about that in the last election. So do you think parents in individual school districts should have veto power over curriculum and textbooks? I think that lesson plans that don't deal with basic life skills like reading, writing, and math, there ought to be some role and respect for parents. Um, I want an inclusive and safe environment, but I believe that that environment is safest and most inclusive when we respect the role of parents. So and what, some of these other lesson plans that wouldn't fall under the categories of basic life skills like reading, writing, and math. What, what kind of mechanism would it require to have something like that be in place? Shouldn't there be a role for educational experts as well? Um, I'm sorry, Dave, your question is what? I'm saying what, what would the mechanism be for parents to have a role in saying what curriculum or what textbooks are appropriate for their school districts? Are you saying that parents in individual school districts should have that kind of veto power? I, I think there are some lesson plans where parents should have some discretion. Uh, I'm not talking about reading, writing, and math. I, I'm just trying to figure out how you get to that. How, what kind of mechanism would you set up for parents to be able to have that kind of say? Yeah, quite frankly, David, I think that's the easy part, giving parents the ability to opt out. The mechanism by which they opt out, I think, is easy to accomplish. What we need to have a conversation on is what subject areas are the areas in which parents should have more of a role.
in deciding whether or not their children are exposed to that curriculum. You also talked about securing our borders. What borders is the government of New Jersey securing exactly? Well, when you take a look what's going on on our southern border, uh, David, here in the country, I think all 50 states are border states. So I do believe what's going on the border is a matter of national security. As governor, I will try to rally the other governors uh, to be in support of working with the president, putting more pressure on the president to secure the border. Um, I know Mexico is a, a very, very important economic partner to the United States. I think we need to put more pressure on them. Right now, they're allowing people to walk right through their country from Central America to approach our border. All right. Other current events. Would, would Governor Jack Cettarelli sign that OPRA reform bill that's making its way through the legislature right now? I would not. You know, the Democrats like to talk, spread this narrative that they're the great protectors of democracy. My goodness, the, the Election Transparency Act of last year is anything but transparent. And they came within a blink of an eye of passing uh, new legislation on Oprah that even former stalwarts in the legislature um, that uh, said was bad, uh, Democratic stalwarts, uh, yeah. who were the original sponsors of the original bill. So um, they've been anything but the protectors of democracy in that respect. You've got some Republicans who also signed on uh, to that bill. I is there room for improvement in the Oprah system? I believe there is. I've always had trouble with commercial requests. I don't like the idea of people uh, doing an Oprah request, getting the information, then selling it for a profit. I also think it was never the intention of the original bill that just because you went and got a dog license meant that you were then going to be bombarded with commercial um, uh, promotional opportunity, promotional things trying to profit off you because they know you own a dog. Yeah. So I think those were some of the things that were unintended consequences that do need to be fixed. So are you a party line guy or an office block convert? <laughs> First time I heard that title, David. Listen, I think county parties reserve the right, the right quite frankly, uh, to vet candidates. Um, there's freedom of association. Uh, I think that uh, they have the right to free speech. If they want to lend their imprimatur to candidates that they have vetted and then endorsed, so be it. All right. It's budget season. Uh, Chris Christie's last budget, 2017, was, do you know the number? $36 billion. $35.5 billion. The current billion one? Is, what's that? The current one is $56, $56 billion. billion. $20 billion increase. Yeah. It's unbelievable. What does it take to run a state? How is, how is your budget going to be different? You know, it's going to be very, very different, uh, David. Everything is on the table. There won't be pork or Christmas tree items. There won't be a $50 million, $58 million French museum in Jersey City. Because uh, you'll, like line, you'll line item veto those? Uh, the governor of Jersey does have line item veto yep. power. So if, um, if I and the legislature are in disagreement, um, I would hope not, because I hope to have the same coattails I did last time, with more Republican people serving in the legislature. But if I have to use the line item veto uh, power, I will. I'm running out of time here. Uh, would programs like Stay NJ and Anchor, would, would they be in place during a Cedarelli administration? You know what I find insulting, David, is when New Jersey politicians in Trenton take money out of your left-hand pocket and put it back in your right-hand pocket and call it a rebate and think of themselves as heroes. We're not going to be doing that anymore. Homestead property tax rebate, senior freeze, anchor, stay New Jersey. Um, these are all administrative nightmares. Literally thousands of people in Trenton looking over the applications. A lot of people don't apply because they don't know about the programs. We need program solutions that are permanent and easy to execute. And what I proposed the other night is along those lines. You would scrap Murphy's energy plan, huh? Should the state move towards or alternative fuels? I don't have my head in the sand in terms of what's going on with the client, uh, climate. I believe in climate change, and I do believe human activity accelerates it. But we need a rational energy plan. The governor's plan is anything but rational. And uh, I really believe the windmills are bad economic policy, bad environmental policy, and bad energy policy. So we need to move away from fossil fuels. 40% of our energy in New Jersey comes from nuclear. We can do more with solar and then wait for these other technologies to catch up, like carbon capture, micronuclear, and hydrogen cell technologies. You said you would support an attorney general uh, or appoint an attorney general who supports police and parents. What's That's the correct. Litmus, what's the litmus test for that? 
uh, I'll have a discussion with who it is I'm going to appoint. Um, I don't believe the school district should be keeping secrets from parents, and we need an attorney general as the head law enforcement officer in the state who has the back of the local law enforcement community. That has not been the case with the current AG. It's demoralizing to the men and women on the front line, and uh, they need to know that Trenton has their back. All right, Republican Jack Cettarelli announcing his run for governor this week. Good to see you, man. We'll see you out there. Thank you, David. Looking forward to it. Of course, we never miss Jazz Appreciation Month. In fact, it's an editorial imperative around here. And for the past 45 years, it has been at the soul of Jazz 88, WVGO-FM, Newark's public radio station, broadcasting jazz all around the world. Steve Williams is the CEO there, and he joins us now. Steve, welcome back to the show, man. Good to see you. Hey, man. It's good to see you, too, uh, David. Thank you so much. In, uh, you were the very first person to uh, have me come on and, and talk a little bit about uh, my uh, uh, my beginning, yeah. the journey here at WBGO. And uh, so here we are again. The last time I saw you uh, was early June in Jersey City. I don't know if you remember. It was like maybe 2 a.m. Rooftop yep. lounge during <laughs> a jam remember. at the jazz yeah. festival. And, and, you know, yeah. as I was sitting there, I was thinking, man, this is jazz, really, because the music really lives in the moment, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And you sometimes you you lose sight of and sound of the fact that the moment uh, is a uh, is an ongoing um, uh, kaleidoscopic uh, people centric moment yeah. that jazz is all about. And that night was a was a perfect example of that. Uh, uh, a lot of folks having a great time and, and, uh, you're having such a good time. You forget what time it is. Yeah. Right. Right. And it is, it's unifying <laughs> music because yeah. at its very core, you have individuals in, in a group improvising yet at the same time swinging collectively. I mean, I don't think you see that in any other music. You, you know, there are other, there are other genres that, that, uh, accentuate the, uh, the collaborative yep. uh, efforts of, of musicians, but jazz is certainly unique. It's sweet, generous when it when you're talking about the way that the the, the practitioners uh, uh, collaborate and share and, yep. and and innovate and create on the spot, uh, which is one of the more exciting things about you know uh, being in a, a jazz environment is that you never really know uh, what's, what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk a little bit about this radio station. Um, which we should say I worked at a long time ago. Um, yes, you did. Celebrating oh, 45 years now. Uh, we should start by saying no radio station format lasts 45 years anymore. Few last 45 months, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> you really got to have a mission, though, don't you? Yes, you do. Uh, and the mission ha has to be, and I think that's part and parcel, uh, the reason why a WBGO can exist for as long as, as it has is that it, you really do have to be about the people, the listener, yeah. the audience, the community. Uh, and BGO has put that uh, at the top of the list in terms of its mission since the very beginning, since its inception, you know, 45 years ago, back in 1979. Yeah. Uh, we are um, we are listener centric here and we're uh, unlike most uh, broadcast entities, we're uh, responsive, maybe even hyper responsive to uh, to our community. So the marketplace is, is so different nowadays. You got streaming services, you got evolving taste, not to mention COVID and, you know, the breakdown of civil society in general. Uh, can you talk about how the place has evolved? I mean, let's start with programming, for instance, technology, and I imagine even AI has had an impact on the sound of the place, no? Sure, sure it has. And you're right about the evolution, speaking to the evolution of WBGO uh, being responsive to our environment, uh, technologically speaking and, and also geographically speaking. Uh, WBGO, uh, well, you have to evolve. You're, we, we are at, at bottom, we are a technology interest. And so we have to be uh, responsive to, to those, those uh, forces that uh, surround us, uh, not just responsive, but uh, but uh, inclusive of that. Uh, and 
since since the station signed on the air in 1979, uh, David, uh, we have uh, continued the evolution. Years ago, you know, we played vinyl, although vinyl's making a comeback now. Yeah, right, uh, right. We evolved to, to, to compact discs. And now uh, most of the, the content that we air on WBGO is digitally driven. And uh, which which allows for greater flexibility. It also uh, allows for greater reach, um, e.g. The, uh, the the WBGO website, which allows us to to reach listeners outside of our our, our service area yeah. here in the New York Newark uh, metropolitan area, because of the the digital transformation that BGO has has been and actually has has led in terms of. In terms of radio stations that that play jazz and and related interests, public media uh, entities, uh, WBGO is one of the pioneers when it when 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 it comes to uh, uh, digital components uh, uh, that further our, our our programming. I'm going to be uh, at the Vanguard um, this weekend for Billy Hart. Um, ah. Places like the Vanguard have survived, but what is the state of the jazz business venues and and uh, mm -hmm. artists being able to sell music, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Well, that, that is a, uh, a frequent topic yeah. of, of conversation among uh, jazz purveyors. Uh, how is jazz faring? Is it, is it surviving or is it thriving? And I, my simple response to that is this. Jazz, as an artistic uh, pursuit and entity, has been with us for over a century. And you don't stay around for a hundred years if if you're not viable and vital. Right. Uh, things come and go, uh, fads and, and fashions and, and technologies even come and go. And certainly in the last hundred years, uh, we've seen uh, several technological revolutions, artistic revolutions that have taken place around the world. But jazz has remained and, and not only remained, but um, uh, thrived and uh, and evolved uh, in that span of time. And again, like I said, you don't stay around for a hundred years if if you don't mean something to a lot of people, and yeah. a lot of interest. How how is the jazz scene in Jersey? I mean, Montclair Jazz Fest, the Jersey City Jazz Fest. Those mm -hmm. festivals are are doing well and growing. Um, Indeed, but you need more venues, right? Um, what about Newark, for instance? Um, well, how are the uh, the venues there? Are, are we getting more venues now? Well, you know, the the, the industry has changed. Uh, and uh, as those who uh, are legacy residents of this area will tell you, there was a time when there were a number of jazz clubs yeah. right here in downtown Newark. Well, uh, times have changed. The business of jazz has changed and evolved, and so uh, Newark has, has has is not at the center of the jazz universe in ways that it was decades ago. Yeah. However, however, um, there are still jazz venues. In uh, NJ Pack uh, has done a, a phenomenal job of keeping jazz and all great musics and, and artistic endeavors alive. Uh, you have the Newark Museum of Art uh, that has also uh, put forth a, a, a priorities of, in, in, in terms of jazz music. And then soon we'll have Newark Symphony Hall, uh, which is which is going through a uh, renovation and revitalization that will also be a destination uh, for those who are seeking uh, uh, jazz sustenance yep. in this area. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's not an easy proposition because right across the river there you have the most active uh the most dynamic and certainly if not the oldest one of the oldest jazz centers in the world in, the world. in new york city and so uh the fact that newark can still uh still survive in in that area uh speaks to its its relevance and and to uh the the power uh and the um the vitality of, of this community as it relates to jazz and other artistic concerns. All right. Steve Williams is the CEO at WBGO Radio in Newark. Good to see you, man. Continue good luck Likewise. and happy birthday to everybody over there. Thank you, David. And that's Chatbox for this week. Thanks also to Jack Cettarelli for joining us. 
You can follow me on X at David Cruz NJ and dive into the chat box archives with full episodes and more when you scan the QR code on your screen. I'm David Cruz. For all the crew here at Gateway Center in downtown Newark, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Major funding for Chatbox with David Cruz is provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. Promotional support is provided by Insider NJ, a political intelligence network dedicated to New Jersey political news. Insider NJ is committed to giving serious political players an interactive forum for ideas, discussion, and insight online at insidernj.com.